Hello, my name is Jordan Street, and I'm from the University of Florida's Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. This presentation on the applications of compressive sensing is done in fulfillment of a class project for image processing and computer vision. We'll start with an overview of compressive sensing and then move on to three specific application case studies. Additional related work will be examined and an overview of the MATLAB programs developed for this project will be given. Before we go into the mathematical details, we start with the observation that most signals share some underlying structure. The figure on the left shows how a triangle wave can be decomposed into distinct Fourier modes, and the figure on the right shows the wavelet decomposition of an image which is used in the JPEG 2000 compression standard. Compressive sensing theory asserts that we should be able to take advantage of this knowledge and devise more efficient data acquisition models or sub Nyquist sampling techniques. Another term key in compressive sensing is sparsity. Sparse signal is one in which there are few non-zero components. The signal shown is dense in the time domain, yet sparse in the frequency domain. So how do we take advantage of this sparsity? Let's first talk about compressive measurements. You can think of these measurements in terms of matrix multiplication. Each measurement Y is a linear combination of the elements of X with the weighting factors being assigned by the matrix phi. By taking fewer measurements than there are elements of X, we result in an underdetermined linear system. One approach to solving this problem would be to use the pseudo inverse. The pseudo inverse guarantees the minimal L2 or minimum mean squared error solution, but not the sparsest solution. To solve this then, we minimize the L1 norm of X subject to the equality constraints of Y equals phi X. Recall that X is our time domain signal and isn't necessarily sparse. We identify a basis psi, which X has sparse representation on, and in the following examples, this is the DCT basis. X star now is a sparse signal which we can use in our L1 minimization. The equation Y equals phi psi X star takes our sparse frequency domain signal X star, maps it to the time domain through psi, and evaluates it through our measurement matrix phi to match our measurements Y. X hat is our final estimate of the original signal X. One of the challenges of applying compressive sensing is coming up with a physical interpretation of the sensing matrix phi. In this system proposed by the ERL at MIT, multiple copies of the input signal are modulated and integrated by distinct pseudo-random codes. Here, each of the M channels represents a row of phi, and the number of samples, in this case Fs over N, represents the number of columns of phi. To simulate the system, we generate a signal which is a sum of five random sinusoids. Note that the signal has sparsity in the frequency domain. The length of X is 1250, and Psi is chosen to be the DCT basis. In this first plot, the signal is reconstructed from only 50 out of 1250 measurements. The first plot bears little resemblance to the original signal, and we can conclude that more channels are necessary for reconstruction. The second plot doubles the number of measurements to 100, and we see a dramatic improvement in the reconstruction's SNR. Continuing to increase the number of measurements, we see improved performance. The reconstruction with 500 measurements is almost indistinguishable from the original 1250 element signal. Shifting now to image processing, we note that the same sparse frequency domain representation is apparent in most imagery. If we are given an image with missing pixels, we can exploit its sparsity on the DCT basis and model the missing pixels into our sensing matrix to recover an estimate of the original signal. In this algorithm, images are split into blocks where each block is reconstructed independently. This lends itself to a very efficient FPGA or a GPU implementations. We first partition the image into 16 by 16 pixel blocks. The columns of each block are then concatenated to form a 256 element long measurement. A sensing matrix is initialized to be the identity matrix, and then any diagonal elements of that matrix corresponding to missing pixels are set to zero. In this manner, our sensing matrix phi maps the full image to our partial image. With Psi chosen as the DCT basis, we perform the standard L1 minimization as before to recover our estimated patch. All patches are then placed together to form the final solution. These next few slides show results of the algorithm with 25, 50, and 75% data loss. PSNR is calculated before and after reconstruction and used as a performance metric. 
we see that the reconstruction algorithm remains robust through even severe data loss. This table summarizing the previous results shows consistency in reconstruction error across multiple images and varying data loss. We can apply similar techniques to the end painting problem. On the right, you see an image corrupted with a text overlay. By modeling the corrupt region of the image as missing data, which in this case is all of the red text, we can apply the same reconstruction techniques to recover an estimate of the unobstructed image. Here you can see the algorithm completely removes all of the red text from the input images. There's been a lot of related work done in this field. Two examples are shown here from Duke and Rice Universities. Researchers from Duke modified a standard 30 frames per second camera with a high speed coded aperture and were able to extract video at the coding rate using compressive sensing techniques. Another example is the single pixel camera built at Rice. Digital micro mirror devices, which are a form of spatial light modulators, are used to take linear measurements of multiple pixels in an image. The image is then developed offline using the same compressive sensing techniques. I'm now going to go through an overview of the programs developed for this project. So we have open here the workspace containing all of the programs written for this project. I'm going to go through the signal reconstruction folder, missing pixels folder, and end painting folder. So within the signal reconstruction folder, we have this main signal CSM file. This file generates uh, a signal made up of, in this case, five random sinusoids. It then takes compressive measurements according to the number of measurements and then reconstructs the signal using the L1 minimization techniques we talked about previously. It's worth noting that to do all of the convex optimization problems, and specifically the L1 minimization, we're using the CVX toolbox, which you can find more information about at cvxr.com cvx. This allows us to focus on the theory and applications of compressive sensing without getting bogged down in the mathematical intricacies of convex programming and optimization. We essentially uh, declare variables and then can write straightforward statements just like shown here and have the software package do the minimization for us. So once the signal has been reconstructed, we plot um, both the time domain and frequency domain representations along with the SNR of each signal. Now going up a folder, in the missing pixels directory, we have this restore patch function. This takes in a patch of an image along with a mask. The mask tells the program which pixels are corrupt, and then it applies the algorithm we talked about in the missing pixels section of the presentation, where each 16 by 16 pixel patch is uh, modeled as a separate compressive sensing problem. Once that patch has been reconstructed, it's passed back to the main program, which is missingpixels.m. Uh, from the beginning, this allows you to load in an image. Uh, you delete a certain volume of pixels at random. And it's also worth noting that there's two different ways this can work. You can either be deleting uh, whole pixels or you can be deleting elements of a pixel. So for example, uh, with the way it's set up now, you might be deleting the red and green elements of one pixel, uh, just the blue of another pixel, all three from another, none from another, uh, any sort of combination. If you uncomment this line here, then it switches to deleting the red, green, blue elements of uh, an entire pixel uh, for the same volume. So once uh, you've corrupted the image, you do the same sort of L on minimization. This goes through, breaks the image up into 16 by 16 pixel blocks, and then passes each block to the uh, restore patch function we went over a second ago. It then takes uh, all of the restored patches, stitches them together. Uh, we calculate a couple different error metrics and then display the results with this code right here. The final folder relates to the end painting example shown. The same restore patch M function is used in this. Uh, for the main program here, we load in the image. Since the, since the focus of this was on demonstrating compressive sensing for end painting recovery, we didn't uh, go through that much of a effort in identifying the corrupt parts of an image. We use non-anti-alias text so that we can simply go and see, all right, 
whichever pixel has 255 for the red component and zero for the other ones, we're going to mark that as uh, missing data or corrupt data that has text overlay. If this is going to be implemented in a real application, you need to have more robust detection of obstructed portions of the image. Once the obstructed portions are marked, we go through the same uh, compressive sensing techniques to recover each 16 by 16 pixel patch and then we stitch like before all the patches together and display the final image as output.